You're listening to the Finding Christ in the Old Testament series, preaching by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would. Look at 1 Kings chapter 1 this morning. We start today in the book of Kings. Uh, Long awaited, we've been in the New Testament for some time now. We started in the Old Testament a few years back, and now we're returning where we left off, 1 Kings. 1 Kings covers the dates of about 970 to 586 B.C. It describes the period of the monarchy in ancient Israel. 1 Kings is full of villains and heroes. It's just a great, great narrative. And 1 Kings provides for us the, the answer to the questions left in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, about chapters 9 through 20, the question is, who will succeed David? The kingdom looks like it's in trouble. Absalom had rebelled, David had fled, he came back, and then Sheba starts his rebellion to take the the ten tribes away from David. And it looks like the kingdom is balancing on the edge of a knife, that it could fail at any moment. And and you're going to see that this morning at the beginning of Kings chapter 1. But here's the truth of the matter as we look at kings. That Yahweh maintains the kingdom in all of its precarious moments. And I want you to know something this morning. That Yahweh's hand still guides his kingdom today. And in all of our precarious moments, in our doubts, in our fears, in our anxieties, the God of heaven knows and cares and guides and leads. He is the sovereign king and the Lord of lords. He knows where you're at today. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you need, and he's a good, good father. In the first Kings, we see there's a hand that steadies the kingdom. And I want you to know in our lives as believers, there's a hand that steadies us. Oftentimes, invisible, not seeing, not knowing. When we step away and trace his hand, we see it in a glorious and marvelous way. There is a God who never fails to love his people or to keep them under his kingly care. And so as we go through this study in this series, I want you to remember that our God is sovereign king, and he keeps us, and he keeps us well. So let's begin this morning in 1 Kings. I'm going to read a large portion of scripture. I want you to get the full impact of the story this morning, so don't check out, right? Some of you folks, when we start reading scripture, this is a bad thing, You think you know the story, you've heard it before, let's get to the message. Uh, This is the message. And so, don't check out, we're going to read the story and then go back and explain some things. So please, stay with me, listen, even if you know the story well. Listen, put yourself here, feel it, smell it, experience what's happening here, because the kingdom is in a perilous, perilous state. The question is, who will be king? What will happen to the kingdom? 1 Kings chapter 1, starting at verse number 1. Now King David was old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. Therefore his servants said unto him, Let there be sought for my lord the king a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, that my lord the king may get heat. So... They sought for a fair damsel throughout all the coast of Israel and found Abishag, the Shulamite, and brought her to the king. And the damsel was very fair and cherished the king and ministered to him, but the king knew her not. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and fifty men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. And he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the priest. And they followed Adonijah and helped him. But Zodak, the priest, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan, the prophet, and Shimei, and Rei, and the mighty men which belonged to David, were not with Adonijah. And Adonijah slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle by the stone of Zoheleth, is literally the stone of a serpent, which is by Enrogel, and called all his brethren, the king's sons, 
and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. But Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah, and the mighty men, and Solomon, his brother, he called not. Therefore Nathan spoke unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, doth reign? And David, our Lord, knoweth it not? Now therefore, come, let me, I pray thee, give counsel that thou mayest save thine own life and the life of thy son Solomon. Go and get thee in unto the king David, and say unto him, Didst not thou, my lord, O king, swear unto thy handmaid, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon thy throne. Why then doth Adonijah reign? Behold, while thou yet talkest with the king, I also will come in after thee and confirm my words. And Bathsheba went in unto the king into the chamber. And the king was very old, and Abishag the Shulamite ministered unto the king. And Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance unto the king. And the king said, What wouldest thou? And she said unto him, My lord, thou swearest by the Lord thy God unto thy handmaid, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. And now, behold, Adonijah reigneth. And now, my lord the king, thou knowest it not. And he hath slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the sons of the king, and Abiathar the priest, and Joab the captain of the host. But Solomon thy servant hath he not called. And thou, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are upon thee, that thou shouldest tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it shall come to pass, when my lord the king shall sleep with his fathers, that I and my son Solomon shall be counted offenders. And lo, while she yet talked with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in, and they told the king, saying, Behold, Nathan the prophet. And when he was come in before the king, he bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, hast thou said Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne? For he has gone down this day, and hath slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the king's sons and captains of the host, and Abiathar the priest, and behold, they eat and drink before him, and say, God save King Adonijah. But me, and I love this, even thy servant, me, and Zodak the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and thy servant Solomon, hath he not called. Is this thing done by my lord the king? And thou hast not showed it unto thy servant, who should sit on the throne of my king the lord after him? Then King David answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. She came in into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king sware and said, As the Lord liveth and hath redeemed my soul out of all distress, even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. And Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, let my lord King David live forever. King David said, Call me Zodak the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. And they came before the king, and the king also said unto them, Take with you the servant, servants of your lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride upon mine own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. And let Zodak the priest, and Nathan the prophet, anoint him there, king over Israel, and blow ye the trumpet, and say, God save King Solomon. Then he shall come upon after him, that he may come and sit upon my throne, for he shall be king in my stead. And I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. And Benaiah the son of Jehoiada answered the king and said, Amen. The Lord God of my lord the king, say so too. As the Lord hath been with my lord the king, even so be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my lord king David. So Zodak the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and the Cherethites and the Pelethites went down and caused Solomon to ride upon king David's mule and brought him to Gihon. And Zodak the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon and they blew the trumpet. And all the people said, God save King Solomon. And all the people came up after him. And the people piped with pipes and rejoiced with great joy, so that the earth rent with the sound of them. This is the word of the Lord. 
I want you to see several things this morning from our text, and I, I, I hope that you're not lost in all that was done. I want to just sort of reiterate some things as we go through. And I don't want you to check out, because the kingdom here is in trouble. I think sometimes we think of kingdom as, well, it's an Old Testament idea, not much for us. I mean, that was ancient Israel, that was a monarchy. But kingdom is prevalent and prominent in the word of God. God's kingdom, God's reign, God's rule. And so this will apply to us. So pay attention. Number one, I want you to see the ugly truth. There are three things in this text that are the ugly truth. Number one, David is decrepit. He's decrepit. And we're talking now about David, the shepherd boy. I don't know about you, but in my life, I've been here now for 17 years, and there's some people that as I see them, they will always be a certain age to me. Right? I see, often I'll see Becca Fieldhouse, and I just think of her as a 15-year-old girl because that's about the age she was when I came here. She's younger than that, probably 13. I see people, I think, yes, they will always be that age. And sometimes we think of David and think, well, he was a shepherd boy. I mean, he killed a lion. He killed a bear. He slew the giant. He conquered kingdoms. He had a royal dynasty. That's David. But now we see David is an old man. He is old and he is cold. And just so that you know, and I'm not making a statement about age, but scholars tell us he was probably around 70 years old. Ooh, sorry. Didn't say it. This is not a, a slam against 70-year-olds. I'm just telling you, for David, at this point, he was old. He was decrepit. You can see him cold in the bed. So bad was his case that they bring a human hot water bottle. And she's a supermodel. It doesn't stir David. There's a sense that he is just out of it. And we get to, to verse number 15, and Bathsheba comes before the king. Now, I'm not going to preach on this, but somebody ought to, okay? Get the picture. You remember Bathsheba, 2 Samuel? The beauty that David lusted after caused him great pain and grief, but it was worth it in the moment. This is probably, for me, one of the most saddest portions of Scripture as I think about Sheba. She's not a beauty anymore. She's an old woman. And she walks in before the king, and she's not the one there anymore. Right? Can you imagine? I mean, he almost lost his kingdom for her. And now she walks in, and there's another woman who is far more beautiful, far more attractive. She's young. She, she is, by all accounts, a supermodel. And she, Bathsheba, walks in before the king. Just a reminder, your sin never lasts. It can be fun, it can be exciting, it can be great, but there's coming a day when it will be old. It will be old. And here's Bathsheba, she comes before the king, and he's in such a bad state that, that he whispers to her a, a Hebrew word that only has two syllables. It's Amar. He's in bed, he's cold, he's old, he's decrepit. She walks in and he says, Amar, literally, what to you? It's as if that's all he can muster in this case. We would see him on his deathbed. She comes in and is like, what to you? That's all he can come up with as Bathsheba comes before him. He uses every ounce of strength. David is decrepit, which is a reminder for all of us. Listen to me. Every king, every magistrate, every president, prime minister, and dictator someday will die. Nobody lives forever. Nobody. Death is coming. It's coming for the saved. It's coming for the lost. And it will surprise you often when it comes. They're asking a group of children why God doesn't tell you when you're going to die. And one little girl said, because he wants it to be a big surprise. Sometimes it is a big surprise. Sometimes it's not. But death is coming. Listen to me. There's only one king who will live forever. 
There's only one king who will reign forever and ever. It's King Jesus. And it might make real good sense to be part of his kingdom. Because those outside of his kingdom will forever be outside of his kingdom. David is old. David is decrepit. David is passing away. And the kingdom's in trouble. Not only is David decrepit, number two, Adonijah is a disaster. This son of David is a disaster. His name literally means Lord, the Lord, Yahweh is master. But this kid's in trouble, man. It's just interesting to note that when the Bible describes Adonijah, they put him in the same sense of Absalom, and they tell us he was a very good-looking man. He was physically impressive. And we think, certainly, that's got to be the next king. He's in line. Look how good he looks. But to mention it with Absalom reminds us of some things. It reminds us that God doesn't look on the external. God looks on the hearts. Absalom looked good. He was a disaster. Saul looked good. He was a disaster. Eliab, David's older brother, looked good. He was not the man. He looked good, but he lacked character. You can almost hear him pound on his chest, I will be king. And listen, Father's Day, right, today, this kid couldn't even wait for his daddy to die. David wasn't dead yet. David hadn't anointed him. David told him nothing. But this kid in his character says, I don't care. I wish he was dead. I am going to be the king. Lack of character. And we get a clue of this lack of character in verse number 6 of our text. Look at, at 6 if you would. The writer of Kings tells us in verse number 6, And his father did not displease him at any time, saying, Why hast thou done so? is a man without character. And we don't have all the reasons, but this certainly is one of them. The Bible tells us David never displeased his son. Paul House says this, Good looks and favored status coupled with a parental indulgence rarely build strong character. Here's Adonijah. Looks good. Lacks character. Why? Part of it is his daddy never said no. He never displeased him. He never said, hey, Junior, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? No. Stop it. Listen, I know some of you teenagers, you really do believe that you know everything there is to know about life. I get it. I was there at one time. Right? You, you've done nothing. You've accomplished nothing. You've experienced nothing. Yet you know everything. Congratulations. You should be employed by the government. It's not a slam against government officials. I'm just saying, if you have that much talent, they should hire you. Because you know everything. No experience in life. You know nothing. And you think your parents are rockheads. Listen to me. Good parenting displeases their children. Why? Because you hate them? No. Listen, parents don't have children because they think, I need someone else to hate. So let's, let's give birth to four of these so I can hate them. No, believe it or not, parents love their kids unless there's something wrong with them. They love their kids, and they tell them no for a reason. They displease them. Parents, don't blow this. Displease your children. You have the green light. The truth is, you have a mandate to do it. And you can sit back and say, well, I want my kids to be happy today and not to parent them. And that might work when they're two, as they're throwing a tantrum in Walmart, and you're promising them the world, oh, honey, please, please, listen to mommy, listen to daddy. And that may work when they're 10, and it might even work when they're 15, and you have no rules, no regulations, just let them go. But I promise you this, it will result in heartbreak, because we are depraved by nature. We're born that way. Our bent is to do wrong, and we need someone to lovingly say to us, no. Is that very hard? Can we, let's just try this. On the count of three, let's all say no, okay? It would be really therapeutic for you. Ready? One, two, three. No. Good. Okay. Parents. What's that? It is your favorite word. Your kids know it's your favorite word, too. Don't say it every time, but you should say no quite often. Okay? Displease them. They need, to be, they need to be directed and helped and encouraged. 
that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Our children to be taught that, and sometimes they must hear no. He was a disaster. He looked good. He lacked character. And then this, he lusted for power. It was all about power for him. He puts himself on the throne. He seeks a posse of 50 men to run before him, telling everyone how great he is. He seeks out friends in high places, Joab and Abiathar. He shows off his personal wealth, and he shows off his religious experience by sacrificing, which is probably never a good idea, on a rock known as a serpent's rock. Right friends, right people, right religion. It was all for him. King me. King me. Listen, the lust for power and position has no place in Christianity. To lead in Christianity means to serve for the good of others. Even the, the, the qualifications for an elder, 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's interesting to note that more than your gifting, your character is important. Because rulers are to lead for the good of others. Whether it's in a church, in a home, in a country, or community, the godly rule for the good of others. And so here is Adonijah, and this guy is a disaster. And then there's Solomon. David's decrepit. He's old. He's out of it. Doesn't know what's going on in the kingdom. Has no idea who's ruling. Adonijah comes. He's a disaster. He's hungry for power and position. He has no character. And here comes Solomon, and Solomon's doomed. He's doomed. He's not invited to this party when all the other brothers were invited. Do you know why? Because Adonijah knew Solomon was probably going to be on the throne. This was not like a peaceful coexistence here. Not inviting Solomon meant that Solomon was in danger for his life. The kingdom is in trouble. The handwriting's on the wall. David's decrepit. Adonijah is a disaster. Solomon is doomed. But look what happens. In verse number 11, there is an unlikely hero. It's Nathan. Nathan shows up. And Nathan is not part of the royal family. He's not part of the government. He's a prophet. And Nathan shows up, and the fact is, humanly speaking, everything rests on Nathan's shoulders. He's as aggressive as Adonijah is, but he's more cunning than the younger man. You know, he's got wisdom. He has old man strength, which really does exist. Young people, these old men, they have real strength, real wisdom. Don't mess with them. Nathan comes, and he intervenes. He devises a plan, and he moves David into action. Nathan, humanly speaking, saves the kingdom. But then I want you to see the urgency of David. Remember when we find David in this chapter? We find David, and he's so decrepit that the only thing he can say is, what to you? I mean, he doesn't know what's going on. He's unaware of the kingdom. He has no concept of everything that's happening. And after Nathan comes to him and tells him about the kingdom, David is revived. He's revived. God had promised David a kingdom and a dynasty. He dare not be apathetic toward what happens to it now. He is revived. And now there's no longer this two-syllable, what to you? David starts now barking out orders on what to do. And unlike Adonijah, the old man knows how to gather a dream team. He says, take Solomon. Put him on my mule. Show that he is approved by the king. Take the high priest, let them anoint him, show that he has God's approval. Put him on the throne, let people know he's my co-king, my co-regent. And take Benaiah and the warriors and show military approval. And this is done. And when it's done, the kingdom is saved. Well played, David. Well played, Nathan. The kingdom looked like it was in trouble, and now it's saved. So we say this morning, okay, that's great, cool story, interesting facts, 3,000 years ago. What does that mean to you and I this morning? Let me ask you a question. If I were to ask you, what did Jesus Christ speak most about in his ministry? What would you, what would you think? What would you say? Just thinking, okay, Jesus on this planet, he walked among us for three years, God incarnate in the flesh. What did he speak most about? What would you say? What would be the natural thing, I think? Love? 
Right? I mean, we think of Jesus, most loving man on the planet. Talk about love. That would be a good guess. What else? Maybe heaven? Heaven's a nice place to talk about. Stop. Don't get there yet. Okay. What? Service? Absolutely. Service? And you hear that? Right? The cross, his death? You hear that. But did you know most of his conversation centered around the kingdom? The kingdom. And, and you can't separate the cross from that because the cross is the way to the kingdom. But it was the kingdom. Believer this morning, listen to me. God has a kingdom. It is his rule and reign. It's where God is. And Jesus Christ talked about the kingdom. Now listen to this. Listen to how important the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, God's rule and reign is in the word of God. A number of verses, just stay with me, okay? Jesus, Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He preaches this. John 3, 3, you know this verse, right? Jesus said, verily, verily, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Reminding us that religion doesn't help you, good works don't help you, being in a Baptist church doesn't help you. You must be born again or you will not see the kingdom of God. He goes on, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things shall be added unto you. Acts chapter 20, verse 25, Paul goes about preaching the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, that tells us no unrighteousness shall inherit the kingdom of God. Colossians 1, 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us unto the kingdom of his dear son. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12, walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom. Hebrews 12, 28, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Revelation eleven fifteen. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and the kingdom of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Listen to me. The kingdom's important. And for you and I this morning, it's important, first off, to be in it. Do you know this morning that you're in the kingdom? Do you know Christ is your Savior? If you die today, are you certain that you are reconciled back to God? You must know that. But now listen to me, for the rest of us, we're part of this kingdom now. Where Christ is, it's where the kingdom is. Christ lives within us. God's kingdom is within us. We are kingdom people. And we're called to be agents of change in the world that we live in now. How much of a role does a kingdom play in your life, believer? Do you ever think about it? It's an interesting story from U.S. Civil War. Tennessee was the last southern state to succeed from the Union. Right? And so when North Carolina was fired upon, Tennessee seceded from the Union. But when they did, East Tennessee, which had a town known as Little Boston, they didn't count on the slave labor. They were more mountainous. They were more part of the Union, they thought. So when, when Tennessee seceded from the Union, East Tennessee seceded from Tennessee. Does that make sense? So what they did was they were a rebellion against the rebellion. Strange, isn't it? They said, no, the U.S. is sovereign. They have no right to do this. They are in rebellion, so we will rebel against their rebellion. This is... The, the Confederacy is not our kingdom. It's not our country. So we're rebelling. Can I tell you something this morning? Believer, there was a rebellion against the king of the universe. A flat-out rebellion. Adam and Eve believed that they, they could do his job, that he was not good, which is a lie that continues on year after year, century after century, millennia after millennia. And they rebelled. They rebelled against a king who is loving, just, kind, merciful, and true. And the world is in rebellion. And God has called a people into his kingdom who are rebellion against the rebellion. We are kingdom believers. And so we look at our text this morning, and I just want to point two things out to you about the players that we see. 
Number one, David. David's out of touch, man. You, you start the book, and it's like he has no idea what's going on. None. He's oblivious to the fact that Adonijah is reigning while he's laying in his bed. But when Nathan comes to him and tells him the kingdom is in trouble, David is stirred up. He's stirred up. He understands this is important to him. I wonder this morning, as kingdom people, what stirs us up? What what jazzes us up? What is it that when we hear makes us active, makes us work, makes us move? What is it? We had court this week. We were robbed about five years ago. And they caught the guy about three years ago, and now we're going to court five years later. The system is awesome. Awesome. And so they had to prep us because the defense has a chance to sort of cross-examine witnesses before they even go to trial. So they're prepping us. So Kim and I go on Wednesday, and we're, we're sitting in the room, and next to us is a woman who lost probably $30,000 worth of stuff. Her husband had just passed away in December. And so now she was here. And she was giving, and she's crying because she didn't write the report, and the woman's talking to her, and we're sitting next to her. And she had to come down from Toronto. It was terrible. And so I'm starting to talk, and I'm starting to get angry. Believe it or not, I was getting angry. And, and the woman said to me, um, are you going to be angry on the stand tomorrow? <laughs> Maybe. And I said, no, no, I'm going to be fine. And then she said, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. <laughs> but I have to tell you, I, I don't apologize. Injustice stirs me up. I hate it, man. I hate it. Christian, what stirs us today? And, and just be, I'm not, be honest. When's the last time you got worked up about the kingdom? I think so many times we get worked up about our portfolio. Man, stock market's good. Taking off. Made some money. Man, I'm excited. Or we're excited or jazzed up about, man, look at my car, look at my sports, look at my team, look at my stuff, look at my appliances, look at what I have. And we're excited and we move and we're activated and we'll do whatever we can do. But when's the last time God's people, kingdom believers, followers of Christ, who've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his glorious light, redeemed, forgiven, cleansed, eternal life abiding in us, When's the last time we ever moved with any zeal for the kingdom of Christ? I'm worried today. We become complacent. And we're like David. Prior to this, we sit around and we're oblivious to the fact that we are in a rebellion against the rebellion. We are called as agents of change. God has a kingdom people, and they're sitting in this building. Unfortunately, what usually moves us is when we're pulled out of of our comfort zone. It's never the kingdom. Here's the truth. What moves me, what aggravates me, what makes me angry, what makes me excited, reveals my heart. And it reveals your heart. Listen, I know there are things we love. I get it. There are things I love. I I love fishing. I do. I love fishing. I even like gardening now. It's really weird, but I'm starting to like gardening. I really am. It's sort of therapeutic. And and this is weird. There's a cat around here. You see that stray cat? I fed it last week. (laughs) It's weird. I, I don't know why I did. I did. No, puppy, stop, stop, stop. Yeah, welcome home, Kevin, thanks. Jerk. Um, No puppies, no puppies. Right. But but we, and listen, there's nothing wrong with things that we love and enjoy. But now think in your own heart this morning. When's the last time you worried about the growth of God's kingdom? The health of God's kingdom? The people of God's kingdom? and the advancement of God's kingdom. If we're all like David, and we are, and we're passing, and we are, 
We have loved ones who are passing. We have friends who are passing. This is the step. And if what we believe is true, that in Christ I have life eternal, and those that don't know him don't have life eternal, then maybe we ought to be a little more stirred about this kingdom. David was stirred about the health of the kingdom, and we ought to. And then Nathan is a servant who loves the king and loves his kingdom. Now listen to me. We believe in the sovereignty of God. God rules and God reigns, and I thank God for it. (laughs) Even when it doesn't look, he's in control. He reigns. But I find it interesting in this text that you don't see much about, about divine activity. It's there. It's obviously there. He rules. He leads. He guides. He puts thoughts. And and Nathan says the right things. And the council sort of just excites David to get on the move. But God uses human people. We have responsibility. And Nathan loves the king. He loves the kingdom. He responds. Now listen. The message this morning is not, well, be like a Nathan. That's stuff that, that's not the, the Bible's not moralistic like that. Or be like David, be a giant killer. That's not the point. The point in David killing the giant is this, that there's a God who will someday destroy all of the things that come against his people, death included. So be careful with that. This is not, hey, be like a Nathan. But it is this. Here is Nathan, who is not royal family, royal servant. But there is real dignity and meaning in this one act who says, that she bought, we're in trouble. You better go and talk to the king. When you talk to the king, I'm going to come and talk to the king because Adonijah is ruling and reigning right now. This is a disaster. And he moves, and it changes everything. Everything. I don't think we realize how. And again, listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying, God doesn't care. It doesn't matter. I'm going to do what I, if we don't work, God's fans, plans fail. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this. God expects us to move and to work and to be involved to do something. And I think so many times we forget how critical our work is. You have a purpose. You have a reason. There's some people getting so upset about the dumbest things today. Stupid stuff. You have a purpose. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than me. It's the gospel. It's the kingdom. And I just wonder sometimes we just sort of put ourselves out because like, well, I could never do anything for the kingdom. Listen to this verse. Uh, Mark. The book of Mark. Chapter 9, 41. You say, it doesn't matter what I do. God's going to do what he's going to do, and my thing is so little. It doesn't. Here's what Jesus said. If you give a cup of water, a cup of water in my name, you'll be rewarded. A cup of water. And here we sit. God has placed us where he's placed us. We're doing nothing. Listen to what Matthew Henry said. He said, whatever power, interest, or influence men have, they ought to improve it to the utmost for the preserving and advancement of the kingdom of the Messiah. He says, whatever God has given you, wherever he's placed you, whatever you can do, we ought to work really hard to be the best that we can be in that area. Why? For my own glory? To rule and reign like Adonijah? No. No. For the kingdom, the eternal kingdom. And so if you're sitting here thinking, that's great, I should be served by the kingdom, but I don't know what to do, let me help you. You want to advance the kingdom? Then tomorrow morning when you go to work, and men, if you're not working, get a job. Work hard, go find something. Do what you have to do. We got to work. We were created to create. But tomorrow when you go to work, you work hard. You do the best you can do. You show up, not with an attitude, with a sense that what I'm doing really does matter. I'm just a plumb machine. That's all I do all day. Then do it to the best of your ability. Do it with the right spirit. And show that there's dignity in work and God has given this to you. And glorify him through what you do. Be the best at it. If it's a surgeon, be the best. If it's a janitor, be the best. If it's a whatever... Do your best. Advance the kingdom of God. It does matter. People are watching. Go to work. Do well. Advance the kingdom. Be the first one to say you're sorry. 
advance the kingdom. You blow it. You're arrogant. Say, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I blow it all the time. Don't wait. Just go say, you're sorry. Put your laundry away. That was from women this morning. I said, put your laundry away. Tell them that, Pastor. How does that build the kingdom? Well, it shows service, and humility, and order, and love for people. You're just not my housekeeper. My clothes, my socks, my pants, blah, 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 blah. Put your laundry away. That's ridiculous. I don't think it is, man. If, I, if we're talking about a cup of water, service in your home or with other people, build the kingdom. Care for your kids. And I mean care for them. Know what's happening in their life. Love them, direct them, displease them, tell them no, live in front of them. Some of you mothers are thinking, oh, I wish I could just serve the kingdom and be out of this motherhood stage. You are serving the kingdom. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, ladies. You are bringing up a generation of kids who should know the God of heaven, love the God of heaven, serve the God of heaven. They're going to learn that from you. Build the kingdom. Help your neighbor. Can I tell you something? We live in a city with people who are hurting all around us. The neighbor's next door. Cancer. Came to my house after vacation, crying about her husband. And said, will you come over and pray with us? Of course. You could do that without asking. I could have done it without asking. I didn't know. Go serve your neighbor. Hey, that old man that has trouble with his lawn, go cut his lawn. Go take his trash out. Go wash his windows. Go serve him to serve the advancement of the kingdom. And when someone says, I can't believe that, why are you doing this for the old man? You can say this. Can I tell you something? I'm really a creep, naturally. I'm not very sweet, not very kind, but Christ saved me. And he's changing me. And he tells me to love people. And I normally don't, but I got to tell you something. I'm trying to practice love because my Savior changed me. Build the kingdom. Pray for the hurting. Oppose evil and injustice. Give out a gospel track. Tell the truth of God's kingdom. And so this morning, I think I should be done. Okay? What stirs you for the kingdom? Does, this, does the kingdom stir you at all? What stirs you? The kingdom should stir you. And then let's leave this place to advance the kingdom. And wherever God has placed you today, today, in whatever area, whatever responsibility, go advance this kingdom because this kingdom is the only kingdom that lasts. And someday we will crown him King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the kingdoms of our God will become the kingdoms of our the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. There's a hand that steadies the kingdom. There is, and I thank God for it. it calls us to be motivated and to work for him.